We're in Genesis 3, and we're studying Satan. And in Genesis 3, he's the tempter. So turn to Genesis 3, and we'll read this. He's the tempter and the accuser. He's the one, okay, get this. He's the one that gave this guy methamphetamine and said, here, try this. And then he went and told the police, this guy's got methamphetamine. Okay. Where'd, where'd, you, where'd you get it from? I got it from Satan. Satan's going, I, ain't mine. Ain't mine. So that's him. He is the tempter of the brethren. Then he's the accuser of the brethren. Okay. So this is what he's doing. Uh, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Your eyes and he's talking about an awakening, but a different kind of awakening. What was that noise? Okay. Makes sense now. All right. Anyway, but it's a, it's a different kind of awakening. Man is, how many years do you think man has before he really does transform into godhood? How long do you think that's going to take? Because we're working on it. We are working on it with technology, with DNA. We're working on it. I say we, humankind, mankind's working on it. They're working on it now. Okay? But it's not going to be just man's work of it. He's got to have outside help. And he's getting outside help from the same kind of spirit that Satan was in the Garden of Eden. Okay? You don't need the Bible. What, what devils tell everybody, you don't need the Bible. You don't need the Word of God. You don't need that. Get away from it. And in that sense then, since the Word of God is in your DNA, that's the Word of God, then the spirit of this day is telling mankind, you don't need your DNA. We're going we're gonna to fix it. Your DNA is bad, it's broken, it's got problems in it. We're going to correct all we're going to correct all the issues, but we're not just going to do it with humans. We're going to do it with every species. Cuz every species on the planet has is messed up and we're going to fix it. And we're going to solve our problems. Okay? You put that in your mind. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you Lord for a, a glorious time. Spent with you. Father, you came down in this church today and across into all the families and homes that we stream to. And then, Father, the recordings are going to go out into more homes. And Lord, you came down in this place today and you did some good things. Father, there's still work to do in people's lives. And I pray, God, that you would do it. And Father, Lord, uh, help us to understand what's going on in our life today. Help us to understand the tempter, the deceiver, the accuser. And how things go in the spiritual realm that we can't see. The Bible's going to open our eyes up to these things. So, Father, enlighten us with your word tonight. We love you. You're our God. You're our Father. We love you. We honor you with everything that we do Every breath we breathe, Father, we love you and we adore you for what you are to us. Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus. Thank you for the blessing of our church, our families. I ask your blessings now on your word. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. amen. Now turn to Job chapter 1. Job, uh, I've mentioned this before. Job, um, the scholars tell us Job was probably alive at about the same time Abraham was. And Job is probably the oldest book 
of the Bible. It predates Moses. Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But Moses came 400 years after Abraham. So Job wrote his, his, I guess his diary of what happened in his life. God inspired Job and told him what was all was going on in the background. That why God afflicted him the way he did. When you think about Job, Job, Job got hit hard. I mean hard hard by Satan. Satan took everything that man had away. I mean everything. Left him with nothing. Okay? In an attempt to get him to curse God. Job didn't do it. His three friends encouraged him they, the wrong way. They counseled him the wrong way. His three friends were lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And that's how you look at it. Okay? But here's the work of Satan. Um, first, let's look in our Bible. I had this on the screen, but let's look in our Bible. Job chapter one, verse one. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. That means he just stayed away from dirty, bad things. He didn't, he didn't have them in his house. Didn't have it in, in his life. He stayed away from it. Okay. He wasn't a drinker. He wasn't a, a an adulterer, he didn't, he didn't tell dirty jokes, he, didn't, he, didn't, he was just a clean man. And they were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. That, that must have been absolutely precious to him. Those three daughters, those seven sons, ten children. His substance also, 7,000 sheep. That, you'll never go hungry with 7,000 sheep. You'll never run out of wool either. And 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen. 500 she-asses and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting was gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. He's a type. He's a type of Christ. He's a type of a godly man. I mean, this man loves this. This man understands his children aren't perfect. His children aren't perfect. So he is sacrificing himself and sacrificing of his own to appease God, to beg God to forgive his children. That's what godly people do. Amen. They pray for their children. Amen. So now verse uh, 6 there was a day when the sons of God, these are angels, these are the angelic beings of all types, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Okay? So here's Satan, and you've got all these angels. And then, in verse uh, 7, the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, remember... Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, to and fro, okay? Same idea. He is always searching, going through the earth, okay? Um, he, and that tells you something. Satan is not an all-knowing deity, he does not know everything. And this is evident in this story because if Satan knew the end of all this thing with Job, he would have never, he would have never said, I think I can get him. He didn't know that he, he didn't know that he couldn't get Job to curse God. He did not know that. So he is limited in his power. Now, I'm going to throw some conspiracy stuff in here. There are cameras everywhere. Are there not? Everywhere. And they're putting more up everywhere. Your cell phone that you carry is as easily accept, accessible by the National Security Administration, NSA, 
they can turn the microphone and camera on to your phone whenever they want to. When they have the ability, they have the power. Uh, that's what Edward Snowden told us. He found it out. He leaked it, had to hide in Russia. But he said, we can turn your phone on and see and hear everything that you're doing at any moment. So think about then this all-seeing eye thing that I believe the devil's kingdom is putting together. The ability then to see more than what he can currently see. Because when you're a snake laying on the floor, you don't see much, do you? You don't see as much as a guy standing on top of a ladder, right? So here's the most high God and the most low Satan. That's the opposite, okay? Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in. Um, and the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? That there, God is the one who initiated this. Very, this is so interesting to me. God is the one who, who set this up. Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Satan answered the Lord doth, and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? In other words, look at what he said in verse 10. Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? This is what I was telling you this morning. God put a hedge about Job in his house and protected him. And Satan knew it. Satan was prohibited. There's the black helicopters there flying overhead. Huh? It means somebody's hurt. Yeah, I know that helicopter ride. I've had one of those. So anyway, what was I saying? Hedge. God put a hedge around Job. God protected Job and his whole family. His family God protected. And Satan knew it. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. So verse 11, but put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. That was, that's Satan's accusation. Now, you, if you are saved, you are a child of the living God. But Satan believes that he can bring you back. He can pull you back out. He believes that. He didn't, I don't think he learned it. I don't think after Job he said, well, I'm not going to try that ever again. I think that's in his nature. I think he still thinks that he can pull God's true children back. I think he really thinks that because he goes after us all the time trying to defeat us, trying to get us locked up in sin, trying to lay traps for us, to, to trap us into sins and transgressions and so he can accuse us and, and all of this stuff. And, and it's like I said this morning, when you go running to God for protection you, and forgiveness, you go running God honestly, say, God, I messed up. God, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm wicked. God, I've, I've done terrible things. But God, you told me I could run to you every time. You're my father. And God says, I'll, I'll protect you. I'll cover you. And, but, and God says, I have a lawyer that's on your side. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's my son. and He's great at what he does. He'll win your case for you. Amen. Okay. So, but this is what he does. He is the, he is the tempter and the accuser of the brethren. The accuser. Now, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this to all the internet land and anybody listening. Okay. We've already got an accuser. We don't need another one here. No one has appointed... God took me out of the business years ago of worrying about what everybody in my church was doing. I don't go to your house saying, I think I need to look through your 
browser history? Uh, can I look in your refrigerator? I think I need, to, I need to look through your house, see what you got, see what you guys are doing. That's not my place. I'm not the Catholic priest that you have to confess your sins to. You have an accuser who's standing at the right hand of God right now blabbing everything you've done to God. That's what this story is all about. Okay? So, you know, we know what happened. God withdrew the hedge and allowed Satan. Satan killed all seven of his sons, all three of his daughters, stole all of his sheep, camels, oxes, took everything the man had. So, at the end of that, look at verse 21 of chapter 1. Job said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, not charge God foolishly. He blessed God instead of cursing God. Okay? And I'll tell you something. There's something to be said about being truly saved. Is that you can lose it all. And at the end you can say blessed be the name of the Lord. You know at some point. We're all going to have to face losing people out of our lives. Some of you already have. And when that happens. You just simply say blessed be the name of the Lord. So Job chapter 2, he's going to take it up a notch. And th this, what I'm doing is I'm showing you the power. And you listen to this. Satan has power to kill people. He killed Job's sons and daughters. He killed them. He slaughtered them. He has the power to take human life if God allows it. We know by way of the New Testament now that the one who is, who controls death is Satan. It is in his hands. And when God says this person's going to die, when God releases, when God takes his hand off a person, Satan takes their life. That's what I believe. He has the power of death because he's the tempter. He's the deceiver. He's the liar. Okay. Now, Job chapter 2. So now he's going to try to go after Job's body. Now, I'm not one that says every time you get a sniffle, that's you got a devil in you. Cast the devil out and the sniffle will go away. Or your back hurts. Well, you've got a devil in your back. We need to cast that out. I don't believe that. But I know for a fact, I've experienced it, I've felt it. I've felt physical attacks on my body as part of whatever the devil is trying to do to me. I, I do remember one sermon I preached. I mean, God was just working and doing great things in people. And, and I got, I mean, I was feeling great. And when I got done... I mean, boom, it hit me so hard and I went and crashed in my office and I couldn't even hardly get up off the couch. And it's just everything hurt in me. Okay. That I, I do believe that was punishment. You'll get punished for serving God. You will. Peter did, John did, James did, Paul did. They all got punished for serving God. You will get, the devil will get at devil. And when I say the devil, you know I mean like all the devils that are collected together that are bad. There are some assigned to you. And they will pound you. They will pummel you. They will be a thorn in your flesh. Okay. That, when that verse. When Paul talks about that. 
God is the one who sent the thorn, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. God sent that angel. God did that. Okay? So God will allow these things, and that's their purpose, is to take us through trial, tribulation, trouble. But through all of that, God's still with us. Gloria, wasn't God with you every day? Every day, from the first time you felt sick, here's God working mightily in your life. Devils are there too. But God is ever present there with you, bringing you through this time in your life. Okay? So we know, we know that the devil and devils have the ability to affect the human body in adverse ways. So, Job chapter 2, verse 3, The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and he still, still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without a cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. See, that's the way the devil thinks. The devil thinks that you're like him. That you'll do anything to protect yourself. But God's made us different. In the book of Revelation, we read the saints, how they love not their lives even unto the death. So that's where the devil's wrong about us. So we know that whatever we lose here, we've got a much better thing coming. So Satan answered, skin for skin, but put forth thine hand now, touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So we, we know now that the devil has the power to affect and afflict the human body. That doesn't mean that every affliction is some satanic manifestation. Your body is part of this corrupt world and it's getting older more corrupt our youth and vitality is gone out of us or it's in the process of leaving us and things go wrong with our bodies period just because you read a Joel Osteen book or you listened to Joyce Myers one day and she said, you just name it and all that stuff would be gone. That doesn't mean that's how that really happens. But we know the devil has the ability to take people's lives and to kill. God released, and that was good, that was in my mind for the message this morning. There was a man, uh, Sennacherib, who came against Jerusalem. And he surrounded it with his army. While they were inside the city, they were protected by God. If anybody came out of the city, they were going to get slaughtered. So they surrounded the city. And Isaiah and Hezekiah made their appeal to God. God, this man cursed you. God, this man said that all the gods of all the other cities that he dominated... Didn't, couldn't stop him and our God can't stop him. God, you show him who's God. And God did. God sent an angel in the camp of, in the, of the ar camp of the army, 180 some odd thousand soldiers dead. Boom. That's, that's some bad stuff. Okay. So they do. If you try to deal with satanic powers in your flesh, you will lose. Every single time. They have power. And God will let you get beat up. Just teach you the lesson. Okay. Uh, Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. Here is. Now we get a picture of it. Zechariah is. Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. If you get Matthew. Go back few pages Zechariah chapter 3 and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him and the Lord said unto Satan the Lord rebuke thee O Satan even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee is not this a brand plucked out of the fire Satan has 
power to resist us, to stand against us. When we were supposed to go to Kenya and didn't go to Kenya. I really do feel like that was Satan resisting me going to Kenya because I really wanted to go. I had Lisa and Alicia and the kids at the airport and we were fixing to get on a plane and they said, those kids can't come. Their passports are going to expire and we're not going to allow them on the plane. We're not going to allow them to leave the country. And God shut that... Shut that whole thing down there. And I, I'm, I'm just going, God, I don't understand this. But then I read the Apostle Paul. Satan resisted the Apostle Paul. And if he can do that to Paul, he can do that to anybody. We know from Daniel. Daniel's prayer goes forth to God. God descends an angel to give Daniel the answer. But Satan resisted that angel 21 days. He held that angel up 21 days. Now, what's going on here? Does not God have power over that? He does. But it fulfilled his plan. For some reason, it fulfilled his plan. So we know then that Satan is given power to resist us. We're walking in the river of God to go to heaven, but we're walking upstream. Amen? Amen? And walking upstream is pretty hard. And you get wore out after a while. And that's Satan resisting us. But you know what? It makes us better warriors. It makes us more faithful to the word of God. It makes us more faithful to prayer. It makes us, it makes us shun sin. Is what it does. That's the purpose of all of that. Uh, Luke chapter 13. And I'm just... What I'm doing is I'm looking at verses where Satan specifically is mentioned, where he exhibits one of his various powers that he has. Luke 13, 16. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years. If you've had an affliction... I knew a lady, she's now gone on to be with the Lord. She was afflicted. She lost the use of her legs. Ended up in a wheelchair. And she, off, she prayed many times, God give me my legs back, God give me my legs back. Satan bound her, took away her legs. But she has new legs now in heaven. Okay, he's got that power. He can bind people up. And here we have a daughter of Abraham being bound by Satan for 18 years. And Jesus is going to lose her and he's going to do it on Sabbath day. And it makes everybody mad because he's doing it on Sabbath day. Luke 22 verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now I want you to think about that picture. Why do you sift Wheat. Todd, why do you sift wheat? Chaff is no good, right? Why do they put it on my wheat bread? I don't get that. So, does the chaff have any purpose other than it protects the germ inside, right? So that's your flesh. That's your flesh. Now I want you to consider this. Everybody here is a sinner. What we've learned over the years of sinning is that it's not all that fun. When, when you're trying to live for God and that sin, you just desire it to just be gone. But the sin is bound in the body, the flesh. So the only way the sin can be totally gone is to get rid of the flesh. 
So what does Satan do? He desires to sift us as wheat. That chaff is our flesh. And he desires to make our life hard and miserable and cause us trouble. And what that does with us, it has the effect of good. I'm getting rid of this flesh. I'm getting rid of it. I'm going to heaven. Don't ask me to come back. Okay, that's the effect of it. That's, it's all part of God's plan. Satan, this is the only person that we know of that Satan himself infested his mind. Judas Iscariot. Then entered Satan into Judas Iscariot, or Judas, surname Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. So we know, we know devils have the power to inhabit bodies of people and take them over. Now, they can't just pick people at random. Usually, they, someone who becomes possessed is someone who opened up their mind in occult practices. Normally, that's how that's done. Satan, though, enters right into Judas Iscariot, knowing that he's the, uh, he's the traitor. He's the one that's going to turn Jesus in, and so Satan wants this done. Satan, again, he's not all-knowing. The plan to kill Jesus on the cross was God's plan from before the foundation of the world. We know that. But Satan thought, if I kill the Son, if I kill God, I can have the whole world. I can rule over it. That's what he thinks. We know that's what he thinks because that's what the Bible's telling us through the parables. So he enters into Judas Iscariot, takes over because he's going, I'm not going to let Judas slip. I've got Judas where I want him. I'm not going to let him slip out of my hands. I'm going to do through him what I want to do. And that's exactly what he did. He handed Jesus over to the Roman soldiers. They had the trial. They put him on the cross. Satan goes and hangs himself. Satan's going, yeehaw, I killed God. And then Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. Um, Acts 26. Here we find Satan has another power. Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. When you're lost, Satan controls you. And what's, what's funny to me, in America, there are a lot of people who identify, they don't like Democrat, they don't like Republican. They identify themselves as liberta libertarians. Let me tell you what a libertarian is. The first cousin to an anarchist. Libertarian says, I want the government to mind their business and leave me alone. So you have a lot of people in this country you know, they say things like live free or die. And, you know, they'll have the serpent. Don't tread on me. You know, that was all used in the Revolutionary War. Okay, I get that. But you have a lot of people in this country who claim that no one controls them. No one tells them what to do. No one makes decisions for them. They do whatever they want to do. They, and they demand to be free to live how they want to live. The problem is, they're not free. They are serving a master. They're serving Satan. He's the one. So, so you have a lot of these people that are libertarians because they want the right to smoke dope, marijuana, things like that. They want the right to use like mind-altering drugs like DMT or ayahuasca or any of these other things mushrooms or what psychedelics they want the ability you've got people lobbying in this country
for the ability to use psychedelic drugs. Uh, let me tell you something else you have. You have people working, large corporations in this country, who work in research and development, who use micro doses of LSD to get the, the jumbled mess of their mind out of the way so that they can focus and receive new technologies. Because that's what happens. They take micro doses of LSD, that opens up their mind, and devils feed them secret knowledge. Happens, it's, there was an article, there's several articles that came out a couple years ago. A lot of the people, Silicon Valley, a lot of the research and development guys were using micro doses of LSD to gain an edge in technology research so their company can make more money. And when they do that, they're getting ideas from spirits. Okay? So these people are under the power of Satan. And they think they're free. But they're doing exactly what Satan demands them to do. They're Satan worshipers. They just don't believe they're Satan worshipers. And you don't have to. That's the key to Satan worship. So anyway, to turn... From the power, from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Uh, first Corinthians. Here is, here is a commendation to married couples. Defraud ye not one the other, except to be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this verse, but I think you get it. Okay? The marital act is reserved between married couples only. And if you want to spend time away from each other, give yourself fasting and prayer, that's fine. Come together again so that Satan does not tempt either the man or the woman to step out of the bounds of marriage with the word incontinent means they don't, they can't stop themselves. That's what that means. Second Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. Here's one of them. Here's one of them. He has devices. He has ways to get to people. Do not be ignorant of Satan and how he works in your life. 1 Timothy 5.15 For some are already turned aside after Satan. You stay in this church long enough. You will see people come in. You will see them sit for a while. And then you will see them depart. Sometimes people move away. I understand that. But Satan gets people. Satan gets people who go to church. Does he not? He does. Don't let it be you. Don't let it be you. But he'll pull people out of church. That's what he does. 2 Corinthians 11. Turn there. We'll end with this. 2 Corinthians 11. Let's look at verse. Uh, let's go to verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear. And this, is, this goes back to this verse. Some are already turned aside after Satan. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted. Satan is a corrupter. He corrupts things. He poisons the minds of people. He blinds their eyes to, so they can't see 
the world the way it really is or the world the way God wants to show it to them. They cannot see their own sin. They cannot see their own transgressions. They think that what they do is okay and what everybody else does is wrong. That's how they are. They are corrupted. Their minds are corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. They make salvation a complicated issue. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Satan is the author and the originator of the other Jesus. He is behind the other spirit, and he's the writer of the other gospel. He is the one who brings... All of all three of these things to bear into this world. He is the one who does that so that we get to in the same chapter, go to verse 13. For such are false apostles. Like the popes are false apostles. Anybody in the charismatic Pentecostal realm who calls themselves or another person, this is apostle so-and-so, that, that is an incorrect use of that office. There were the 12 apostles, Matthias taking the place of Judas Iscariot, Jesus calling Paul specifically by in person to be an apostle, the 13th apostle as it were, and that's it. There are no more. So anybody who claims apostolic succession or claims that they are an apostle, they are a false apostle. Such are false apostles. They are deceitful workers. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Christ did not give them this office. They did it to themselves. They gave themselves this office. And no marvel. Verse 14. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, and here's what I think about this verse. I think it's two in two realms. The ministers, the, let me read the verse. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the minister of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I think that's in two layers. Number one, humans who are working on the side of Satan, whether they realize it or not, it doesn't matter. Who are transformed as ministers of righteousness, human agents. But I also believe it involves gods or devils or evil angels who are also the ministers. See, angels are ministers in heaven. And in this case, I think Satan has, we know he has a third of the angels in heaven. He's going to drag down and cast them down the earth. That's his kingdom taking over the world. And I believe that those ministers are transformed as ministers of light. The Watchman broadcast I released today deals with a woman by the name of Betty Andreessen who claims she is a born-again Christian and to this day still claims she believes Jesus Christ, loves Him as her Lord and Savior. But... She willingly has went along multiple times with what she described as like these little gray aliens and then these tall, blonde, blue-eyed, light-skinned, she called them elders, who took her through initiations and all kinds of weird stuff. She says that one there was one trip that they took where all of these transformed in front of her eyes into beings of pure white light. Okay? That's exactly what that says. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. The phrase Lucifer means exactly that. This King James Bible is the only one that gets it right. Only one. So, what's going to happen is... These beings of light are going to descend down on the earth and they are going to deceive the entire world. The people are going to accept them as the saviors, the gods, the ascended masters, the aliens, whatever people call them. They're going to receive them and say they're going to help us fix all of our problems here on this earth. 
That's coming. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. Biblically, I see it. That's your fourth kingdom. And they're going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. Transforming mankind. So think about what he's saying here in verse. Therefore, there's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed. Transformed. As the ministers of righteousness. There's going to be a transformation process taking place. Everybody here on this earth. Except God's saints. Because he's got them under his wings. You stupid alien. <laughs> Take that. Are you surprised I still have this up here? <laughs> you stupid aliens. I hate you. I got to get a laugh every now and then. Amen. All right, let's go to prayer. I appreciate you coming this afternoon. Appreciate you bearing with me. I uh, appreciate um, the spirit that we had in the service this morning. It was very, we needed it, I needed it, and uh, I hope God does good things with our church. Amen? Father, this church does not belong to me, it's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. You can extend her life, or you can... Pull the plug today. But Father, I love this church. And I love the people in this church. And I'm willing to long suffer with them. I'm willing to be patient with them. I'm willing to help them in any way I can. Because you've helped me. And Father, I pray to your God that you would use this church and bless it. And... Um, I pray that souls would be saved. I pray that people would be informed about how Satan is, what he does, how evil he is. There's no limit to what he desires to do in, in his work against us. Father, we thank you that we have you as our God and our protector. Keep us from Satan. Keep us from his devices. Keep us from being used by him. Keep us from doing stupid things, saying stupid things, doing stupid things. Keep us, dear God, from sin. We ask your blessings on your word tonight. We love you in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. You are dismissed.